Hello there, and welcome to the first ever episode of Shots in the Quark. This is the first in a series of videos all about motion. Here, we'll be taking the bog standard laws of motion you'll have learnt in school and explaining why they're far more interesting than you ever thought. Today, we're looking at Newton's first law of motion. Everyone is taught Newton's laws at school, and they probably seemed either obvious or boring. But this is far from the case. Taking a closer look at the first law will reveal surprisingly deep issues with profound implications for physics. So, what is Newton's first law? In his own words, Newton's first law of motion is this. Every body perseveres in its state of being at rest, or of moving uniformly straight forward, except insofar as it is compelled to change its state by forces impressed. In more modern day English, all this means is that if we have some object, which isn't being acted on by any external forces, then we should expect to see it at rest or moving in a straight line with a constant velocity. This all seems rather straightforward, doesn't it? If you have a force-free body, then we should expect to see it moving in a straight line with a constant speed. That seems reasonable. How can physicists possibly complicate this definition? It turns out that this simple statement is far from trivial. In fact, on its own, it's totally useless. It's good for absolutely nothing. To see why, let's consider the following situation. Let's pretend we're in deep space and all that we have with us is Newton, who's here, N, and Einstein, who's down here, E. And the only other thing that's near them is a box, which definitely doesn't contain a cat. Now, because we're in deep space, we can ignore friction, we can ignore air resistance, and the gravitational interactions between these things are so small that we can ignore them as well. Now, let's suppose that Newton and the box are moving like this through space. They're wiggling all over the place. Maybe Newton got hit too hard on the head by an apple. Einstein, however, is just sitting there, stationary. He's just sat trying to work out a theory of everything. Now, from Einstein's perspective, Newton and the box clearly aren't moving in straight lines. They're wiggling like nobody's business. That means that Einstein can conclude from Newton's first law that Newton and the box can't be force-free bodies. Because they're not moving in straight lines, there has to be some external force that's acting on them. This seems like a perfectly unproblematic use of the first law. But if we start to look at things from Newton's perspective and compare them to what Einstein saw, then we start to encounter some issues. You see, so if Newton and the box are wiggling in sync like this, then Newton will actually see him and the box as being stationary. Because if you look at the wiggles, so long as they're moving at the same rate, then the distance between them will always be the same. Okay, so Newton sees the box as being stationary. But what he sees Einstein doing, he sees Einstein wiggling away from him. So Newton, with his own first law, will conclude that himself and the box are force-free bodies, they're not being acted on by any force, and Einstein is being acted on by a force, because Einstein, according to Newton, is clearly not moving in a straight line. So what we have now is that from Newton's perspective, him and the box are force-free, and Einstein is being acted on by a force, but from Einstein's perspective, Einstein isn't being acted on by a force, it's Newton and the box that's being acted on by a force. So who's right? If all we have is Newton's first law, then there's no way to answer the question, who's experiencing what force? What we learn from this is that it's all well and good to say that force-free objects move in straight lines with constant velocity, but we need to decide what counts as a straight line and what counts as a constant velocity. Relative to what do we decide when an object really is traveling in a straight line with a constant velocity? We need to pick a perspective with respect to which we measure everything. We can see from our situation here, however, that we can't just say that everyone's perspective is equally valid. Otherwise, whether or not an object is really experiencing a force depends on who you ask. If you ask Newton about the box, he'll say that it's not experiencing a force. If you ask Einstein, however, about the box, he'll say that it is. We don't want this. If an object is actually experiencing a force, this should be a fact that everyone agrees on. We also can't say that any particular person's perspective is always correct. Otherwise, there exists one special person in the universe who can look at an object and tell whether it's really being acted on by forces or not. Only this person, if they saw an object moving in a straight line, with a constant speed, could use Newton's first law to say that this body was force-free. Everyone else in the universe 
would either have to know how this special person was moving or know what the universe looked like to them in order to deduce whether an object really was being acted on by forces or not. This is clearly ridiculous. So what is it that we need to measure everything relative to? Newton realised that these problems existed in his theory and so suggested the only solution that seemed sensible. He postulated the existence of absolute space. He said that space was made up of lots of distinct points called places, each place existing independently of matter and serving as a possible location for a material object. These points in absolute space were undetectable. We can't measure or observe them. Now, in the case of our drawing here, the whiteboard serves as absolute space. Each atom on the whiteboard surface is like a place in absolute space, and it is capable of holding a mark of pen in that location, the mark of pen being like material objects. By introducing absolute space, Newton now had something to measure things relative to. The first law can now be meaningful. Whether or not an object is really force-free depends on how it's moving with respect to the points of absolute space. If we look at our whiteboard drawing here and take the whiteboard to be absolute space, well, Einstein is stationary with respect to the whiteboard, so he's not experiencing a force. The box, however, there's now a fact of the matter over whether it's experiencing a force. Because it's not moving in a straight line relative to the points of absolute space, the box is experiencing a force. Einstein is right and Newton is wrong, as usual. So if we have absolute space, does this mean that the first law makes sense now? I'll let you into a little secret. Nothing in physics really makes any sense. Sure, postulating the existence of absolute space certainly fixes a problem with the first law, there's now a matter of fact over whether an object really is experiencing a force, but we're left with a practical problem. How do we know how things are moving relative to absolute space? If we want to know whether something is really being acted on by a force or not, then we need to know how that thing is moving relative to the points of absolute space, which means we need to know where these points of absolute space are. But how can we do this? Newton said that these points were undetectable and unobservable. We can't see them. And worse, no experiment can ever tell us where these points are. Let's assume that absolute space exists. And suppose you point to a place you can see right now. In the instant you pointed, you will have identified a point of absolute space. But where is that point a second after you pointed at it? Well, it's not going to be where you're still pointing because the Earth is hurtling around the sun. So any point you've just pointed to will have zipped past. Perhaps we could say that the sun at the center of our solar system is stationary relative to absolute space. But just like the Earth, the sun is on the edge of a spiral galaxy and so is zooming through space. So it's unlikely that it is stationary relative to absolute space. Newton was well aware of these troubling problems, but he couldn't find any way of solving them other than just to say, let's ignore them. It turns out we don't actually need to know where absolute space is located in order to use Newton's laws for our everyday purposes. If we ignore the undetectability of absolute space and instead pick a convenient perspective to work from, we can still use Newton's laws to predict how the things around us move. We just can't say whether they're moving absolutely or whether forces are actually acting on them. This is why you're still taught Newtonian mechanics in school. It works fine for practical purposes and this is all you need to know about. You're never told about absolute space because you don't need to know about it in order to use Newton's laws. Theoretically though, Newton's first law is a nightmare. It relies on invisible, undetectable entities, the places of absolute space, which determine whether objects really are feeling forces or not. And yet for all practical purposes, we can ignore the existence of this absolute space. One might think that if absolute space is invisible, undetectable, and produces no observable effects, then it's something we should consider getting rid of. In hindsight, we know that this is the correct thing to do. Recognising the problems with the first law and with absolute space is the first step on the path to Einstein's special relativity. Thanks for watching, and I hope Newton's laws don't seem quite as boring as they did before you watched this video. If you enjoyed me rambling in front of a whiteboard, please do leave a like and subscribe for more Shots in the Quark.